Hello everyone, this is the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage and I am bringing to you uh, the next installment of a video I began when uh, we took apart uh, pieces of the shuttle and race and hook mechanism for this Singer 185J. Uh, and as you recall, this applies to more than just this machine. If you have a Singer 66, if you have a Singer 99, or the 185J, which is really a Singer 99 posing as a 185J with different exterior, then this should apply because this design was in production a very long time. Now, in the early part of the first video, I mentioned to you all I was going to take out the race. And what I was really referring to <clears throat> was the bracket that sits inside the race. I misspoke. Sorry about that. Uh, you were probably wondering, hey, when's he going to take the race out? Uh, one of my viewers, I appreciate the, they, they made a comment. They mentioned that, of course, you can take the race out. And if you have timing issues with the machine, you can do this. Now, in the Singer 201s particularly, uh, I always take the race out because th that race mechanism, <clears throat> the race and shuttle mechanism on the 201 is shaped like a frying pan. And underneath are, is, a, is a place where lots of thick, old lint and, uh, and uh, sludge, for lack of a better word, hides. Now on these <coughs> machines, the mechanism is shaped more like a bowl. And so I don't find that, I, I find that with a lint brush uh, and my, my cotton swabs, I can get this area clean. I haven't really had an issue. So if I had a timing issue, of course I would remove this. Uh, the viewer is correct, it's not hard to remove and then you would simply reset the timing. But again, for this procedure, I have not had the same need to remove this for general uh, restoration cleaning as some of, um, uh, some of the things I found with the 201. The 201 takes me longer in, in part because I have to remove the race in order to clean it. But I don't have that issue with these and I typically don't do it. Now you may feel the need to do so to get in there and clean and if you do, that's fantastic. Uh, of course, as you remember, I was going around making sure that this area, uh, the race underneath and above, is clean. I took my, uh, actually I didn't do this in the first video, but I'll show you. This, of course, is the bobbing case. And uh, by the way, I, I noticed that um, in one of my videos on grease wicks that I'm going to be posting soon, I mentioned to you all that there are uh, cotton swabs of different shapes now. Uh, the one here in my, on my left, I don't know if this is going to show up very well in the camera. It's, the one on the left is traditional. It's a good quality and it's round. It's got plenty of cotton on it. But this one here has, the cotton is more dense and it's tapered. And uh, you may find that really useful at times when you're trying to clean certain, certain items. So I'll show you an example of what this looks like. So I took in my isopropyl alcohol, this is the 91% stuff, and I took and I took the, the, um, the cotton swab and I went around the bobbing case. First I brushed off, brush, always brush off your loose dust with your lint brush. That's just the easiest way to get it off quickly. And then you wanna go behind and take that uh, cotton swab dampened with alcohol and you're gonna find residues of old machine oil. People have often over oiled this area and you're going to want to get that clean. It's not hard. It'll, it should come right off. You can see I've got this and a couple of other uh, cotton swabs where I've actually removed that. Another thing you will want to do is, after dipping your swab in alcohol, you will notice that the bottom of these bobbin cases right here, they, they often act as a little nest area for lint and old oil. So you want to take it with a little uh, alcohol on the cotton swab and just kind of turn it and you'll be able to pull up. You can see I've gotten a little, uh, some of that's come up. That's nice to do. Um, these machines are tough. They obviously run when they're dirty, but boy, are they going to run so much better when you clean them because they were designed for this, right? They, they, they were designed to, to have someone regularly go in and give them this kind of overhaul. Uh, now, we've got the bobbing case. Uh, cleaned. What else are we looking at? Okay, 
You will remember in the last video I took off the feed dogs in order to get this bracket out of the race area. Make sure that as you're putting these parts back together that you do it in the, in the reverse order. If you don't, if you forget and put your feed dog in, this bracket will not go in and you will have to take the feed, bog, the feed dog back out. Now, take a look at the bracket for a moment. You will see a large pin and that pin is what anchors this bracket down in the race. I'm going to move the camera. I want to show you where that hole is because you can't see it from here. Okay, folks, I'm going to take the cotton swab and point here. The sewing machines have lots of holes and crevices, and I want to make sure I, uh, I'm specific with you all so you know where I'm talking about. Right here is the hole that that pin is going to go in. So if you're facing the machine, it's sort of right of center but coming toward you and it and you'll recognize it because it's uh it's size to to receive that pin and that pin is going to anchor into this hole when we put it when we put the bracket back and then you will remember uh when we're done i'm going to go back and there was a screw underneath the machine from the side that set screw that will be tightened and then that will hold this bracket in place so it doesn't go rattling or swerving around any place when the machine is in operation Okay, back to the bracket. Now, <clears throat> this bracket uh, obviously has a function. It <clears throat> holds the uh, bobbing case in place, and you remember that from the first video when I was taking the bobbing case out. Of course, you remember that that bracket sat there, and then I loosened it by lifting up on the little finger at the end, pulling it toward me, and that allowed me to remove the um, that allowed me to remove the bobbin case. Well, this bracket has another function. All of the machines that were built with this uh, shuttle design that includes the race, the hook, the bobbin case, and this bracket are the Singer 66, the Singer 99, and again, the Singer 185J that you see here. But this bracket had another function. I'm going to try to zoom in and hold this still, and maybe this will come up. I really want you to see this in the light. I've got good natural light today. Take a look, guys. Do you see inside this hole, there are threads? And those threads are there for a specific reason. Now, many of these brackets had a, a little protrusion that is shaped like a cone. Yeah, kind of like a little horn, and it's basically made of wire. Now, uh, I have another 185J and I checked it and it does not have that. I do not know for certain if they changed the design and they only did this or it could be that it's missing its horn. But let's say you have this, this machine and this bracket and you can't find the horn, you can still use it, but you're going to want to take a new felt. Now, I'm going to do a separate video on this felt. Why in the world is he going to do a video on a, on a piece of red felt? Because it took forever for me to find an original, which this is not, uh, felt that was still in good shape. Many of you, if you're fortunate enough to have any of the felt at all, what you often end up with, and I'm just going to kind of simulate this, you often end up with a nub. It looks something like that. And sometimes it's faded and it'll have turned pink. And that's all you see and you think, well, what's that doing? That is, the rem those are, that is the remains of a once proud oiling wick. Now, for years I saw this and I would put oil on it because I knew it was an oiling wick. Some of you won't have it because unfortunately, uh, subsequent owners of these machines who didn't have the manual or didn't care to read it, they would reach in and they would pull and tear these things out because they apparently thought it was built up lint or thread or fabric. They were worried that something was caught in their machine. If you have one of these, please do not remove it. It is supposed to be there. This machine design, it's the only one I've ever seen specifically in, uh, that used this in the shuttle area. It is a wick that was used for applying sewing machine oil. And you think, well, what the heck does that do? I'm going to put this, now this wick is going to face toward the front of the machine when it's installed, but for the purpose of sort of showing you guys how it works, and I'll tell you how I learned uh, how it was supposed to look. 
I'm going to zoom in just a bit more. Okay, so imagine that this wick is soaked in oil. It's in the bracket. What happens is it meets the race like this. One part of this Y-shaped felt goes above the race and the other one goes below the rim. So above and below the rim like that. Sort of like a dog holding onto a toy is a good metaphor. Okay, now I'm gonna reach over and turn the hand wheel I want you to see. And so you can imagine what this is doing. It is actually oiling the top and the bottom of the race as it oscillates. Now it's not in the way of the bobbin case because remember it's when it's installed, it's going to face toward me, but I wanted you to see, it's easier to show you with the camera like this. So how did I know it was supposed to look like this? For years, I didn't know what it looked like because I'd never seen one. And then I got, um, I found, I believe it was a 66, and apparently it had been serviced and a new wick had been put in many years before when those wicks were still available. It was old and faded, but it was not worn. Apparently someone had it serviced and then put the machine away and never used it again, I don't know. The point is, I just thought, I was so excited because here I was, I saw an actual unworn wick. And I thought, oh, that's it. That's the size they are. Because I have been, not been able to find reproduction replacements and I haven't been able to even find, you know, what the dimensions of this little thing were. So I took the old one as a template and I cut some out for myself. And I purposely made this a little longer than the original, and I'll explain why. If you have the little protruding horn-shaped uh, cage, if you will, for this piece, that, that will help support this, uh, this felt. This, by the way, is merino wool. <laughs> I, I spared no expense when I bought the wool for this. Now, what I did was I trimmed this. I, I, I make them oversized and then I trim them with scissors. I trimmed this one at a little bit more narrow uh, ta and tapered at the end because I needed to go in deeper into this area where it goes. So I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna twist it and push. I'm pushing and twisting in as far as it'll go. Now keep in mind that when this is installed, it's going to be pushing up against the race rim and this should hold it in place. If yours is like this and you don't have the horn protrusion and uh, if it comes out, then you're gonna need to narrow and, and taper the, the, uh, the, the forward end a bit and get it further into there. But this should help hold it in place. And once I've gotten this all set up, uh, I'll show you, you basically just put drops of oil on it until it glistens and you have yourself an oil wick. So uh, again, and I promise, guys, I will do a video just on this. I can't believe I'm going to do a video on an oil wick for a machine, but I am because, because I don't want to put it in this video. The video is running long as it is. So there we go. We've got our wick into the bracket where it was meant to be. Now I need to reinstall all of these parts for you before you uh, run out of time watching my video. All right. So remember, don't put the feed dog in yet because we got to get this back in. Now, uh, I have a few opinions about lubrication for parts. This is what, this is my approach to this. The first thing I want to do is I'm going to take a, a cotton swab and I'm going to dip it down in alcohol and then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to put it down into this area and you can see I pulled out some old oil and dirt and this is what I want to do. I want to clean it, but I'm not going to flood it with, uh, with, uh, sewing machine oil, okay? There's not a really a reason to do that. And I'll dry the alcohol there. Okay, so what am I gonna do? I have a, a theory, and you'll see this when I do videos on servicing and cleaning um, uh, the, the dials. You can't see them, here they are. The dials on a, uh, or the, the, <clears throat> the plates on a sewing machine tension dial assembly, okay? And, and I have a, a similar approach to this right here. There are times when you don't necessarily have to put lots of oil on something because I've cleaned the hole, I've cleaned the pin, but I, I don't want it to oxidize. And so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put one drop 
and I'm going to basically rub it around there, okay? And then I'm gonna take my cotton swab and I'm going to mop up where I put that. Now that's not gonna remove all of the oil. Notice I'm not using alcohol. I'm not cleaning the oil off. That would be silly and a waste of time. But now I have a very, very thin coating of oil. And when that goes down into this uh, hole where it was designed to go, it will, uh, it will share that oil with the hole and that should be enough to hold off any oxidation or moisture damage if there was gonna be any. Okay, so now I'm going to go and I'm gonna put this bracket back in where it belongs. Now, I'm gonna move my camera here because I moved the camera, guys, because I knew my hands would be in the way and you wouldn't be able to see squat. Okay, so we've got our bracket. Our wick is in our bracket. Um, <clears throat> you may want to do this procedure if you decide to put in a new wick and then, you know, you've got everything apart. You might as well clean it if it hasn't been done. Now, I've got the, the pin for this bracket, okay? And that pin is going to go in here. Now, I have a little dance to do here with this thing because, remember, I have my... Y-shaped felt, uh, felt oiling wick, and it needs to bite onto, like a sandwich, the race. I'm going to zoom in even more. It's going to, see if this is going to show up for you. I don't know if you guys can see this. Remember how I was showing you? The top part of the felt is going to come on top of the race, and then underneath the rim, but facing us, is the bottom part of the wick. So, it, you know, pretend it's, it's eating a sandwich here. Once I have the race in that, in that space, in the, in the middle of that, I'm going to then take, watch out for my hands there so you can see. I'm gonna take the bracket and I'm gonna take that pin, I'm gonna hunt for that spot where the pin goes and I can tell and, well, I thought I could, there we go, and there it is. Now, you wanna take a look at your felt. Let's see if I can get even more zooming here, Let's see what we can see here. See if it'll pick it up for you. Now, uh, I need something to point that won't be in the way. Okay, so uh, you can take any, you can take a screwdriver, whatever it is, and you wanna come over here, and I'm going to look at my felt, okay? And I want it to kind of be straight. It should be coming straight toward you. And the other thing I wanna look at is how long it is because if it's too long, it's gonna drag past the race, it's going to hit uh, the body of the machine, and that's going to make it want to leave, okay? Now, when I'm moving the hand wheel, ooh, good thing I have long arms. Uh, when I'm moving the, the hand wheel, you see the race moving, but look at the wick, the wick is staying put. It seems to be happy, uh, and you'll have to gauge this, you'll have to watch, if it was too long, that wick would be wiggling and moving up against the body of the machine and then you would take it out and you would trim it. And it's okay if you have to trim it because the same thing may be going on underneath. Now, I'm gonna lift, I, we haven't put this in, we haven't bolted anything yet. Let's pull it back out. Now, you can see, well, that's a macro shot there. You can see the bottom wick has kind of bent down because as I pulled the bracket into place, it actually pushed on this wick. And so now I want to decide, okay, do I need to, because um, I want this wick to come all the way under the rim. So now I'm going to take scissors and I'm going to trim that bottom. All right. This is a two-handed operation here. Uh, okay, now hopefully you can see what I'm doing. I'm going to take my scissors and I'm gonna trim. Now I know which side of the, the uh, Y is lower. I'm gonna trim, do this a little at a time because if you, if, you, if you cut off too much, you, you know, you're gonna have to start over. All right, now, now that, you know, you have to remember why, you might think, well, why didn't you trim this before? Because I'm turning the wick, I wanted to get in there. Um, I can even push with a, this little tool, make sure she's in there as much as possible. You saw me twisting it in, it should have good bite. Now, now when you look at this, uh, this bottom part of the wick is going to go under the rim. And you, and you might think, well, gosh, it may not reach. But remember, we're this top part is coming past here. 
So that should do, do us fine. I can even remove a little bit of the top part of the wick. It's probably not going to hurt because I'm still going to be covering the top of the race, right? I think I moved like a sixteenth of an inch there. So again, go slowly. You can always pull this right back out. So if you look at it in profile, that's what you're looking at, all right? And, and I purposely start with it a little longer. When I look at the, when I took the original Singer felt that was in good shape, I, uh, I used it as a template, but I made mine a little larger because I like the flexibility of being able to, to, um, to, 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 you know, customize the fit of that a little bit. Okay, let's go back. We're gonna get our, again, our felt to grab a hold of the, the, the race like it's a sandwich. Uh, again, top felt above, bottom felt below the rim. And once that's happened, I'm going to kind of scoot this back, doing it with one hand here so you can see. And you'll notice that that pin, you keep looking for, that, for the hole for that pin. And where are you? And be careful because if you come out too far, you'll lose the the bite of your felt. There it goes, and it went right in. Okay, now we have set our um, we have set our bracket back in. We have cleaned. Now, there's a couple of things you can do here. You can put in your bobbing case now, or you can do it later after the feed dogs are in. It doesn't hurt anything to put the bobbing case in. You don't have to fight as much. Remember, if the feed dogs were in there, and you'll, you know, you would lift up, move this over, and pull your uh, bobbin case out. You don't have to remove feed dogs to get the bobbin case out. But while the feed dogs are out, we might, uh, we might decide what the heck. We'll put this in here. And now, I've got this in. I'm holding. Come here. <laughs> I'm holding the bobbin case. Now remember, guys, the bobbin case is sitting here and it's floating. Okay. It doesn't actually, this bracket holds it up into the, the race. It kind of holds it in position, but it doesn't really hold it down. It's not overlaying the bobbin case. And yeah, you can see things and see how it's moving. And I see my felt wiggling a little bit there. So I'm going to pull it back out, pull my bobbin case out. And I want to take this out and I want to see, perhaps we trimmed too much off. We don't know. Let's take it out. You'll notice when I had this a little longer that it was not wiggling because it was in place, but I wanted the, uh, the bottom to be, sh here, find the camera. I wanted the bottom to be shorter than the top. Okay. So let's see if I can make it a little bit longer. I tugged on it just a bit. It's still, it's still well in place and I want it to stay put. So, uh, felt bites the, the, uh, race there. Okay. Now we're going to move it back into place. It, remember that felt should be facing you. Kind of at an angle at the moment, but it should be facing us. Okay, now, all right, it's wiggling some, but it is moving, and I don't like that. I don't want it to do that. Not happy. What does that mean? What did I do? Okay, sewing machine restore. I trimmed it a little too, there's a happy place where this felt wants to be. If I trim it too short, it tends to want to move, and it'll work. If I make it too long, it'll bunch up. So I'm going to take this one out and I'm going to take another because I have, a, I have several that I uh, have on hand. I actually think it's really nice if you see someone who has restored quite a few sewing machines in the past to see uh, someone uh, make an error and have to correct their error. Uh, because you, you, all, you guys can do this. Some people are intimidated by this stuff, believe me. Uh, I have no problem having you see me screw up my own felt, and then I'm going to show you how to fix it. 
Uh, it's knowing how to fix it that's really going to be, be helpful here. So let's see what I got right about the first, my first attempt with the felt. You'll notice that the tapered in, I trimmed it so it was a lot narrower than the template. These are the ones that I've cut. The one on the left is what I start with. And this is based uh, roughly on the original Singer uh, felt that I found. And you can see I had, sh not only did I shorten this one, but it was also tapered more. Now the tapered part we need, we're gonna need that tapered part so it will go further into that threaded hole and, and, and get some bite in there so it wants to stay. So you get to see that part of this because I'm gonna redo it. I'm taking my scissors. Gonna to have to pan out here just a bit because right now all you can see are the the bolts of the scissors. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna trim that in. Be careful if you trim too much, you'll uh, you'll you'll lose the integrity of the whole piece and you'll have to start over. Uh, remember, this is felt; it's not fabric. So uh, now, notice I'm coming around. And I'm kind of trimming it a little bit. On, on each on each uh, each edge and what I'm doing is it's it's almost like you were shaving a carrot <laughs> and I'm basically taking this and, and remember don't cut near the Y because you're gonna weaken this thing you just want to do this down in the in the root of it sometimes you have to make up terms as you go here folks I don't know I have yet to find a book on vintage singer oiling felts. If you have any resources for this, please share them because I would be all ears. Okay, now I've gotten the, <clears throat> let's not switch sides on you. Okay, on the right is the felt that I had, but I trimmed it too short. And on the left is I have now tapered this one. Uh, might taper it even a little bit more. Let's see, let's taper just a tad more. You can see it in profile. It's kind of a kind of a triangle shape here. What I'm trying to do is taper like as if you were sharpening a pencil, okay, in a sort of a cone shape. Now I've gotten this, this is the new one of the second try. Now <clears throat> I'm going to go back to my bracket from the top. <laughs> you if first you screw up, you know, you try it again, guys. Uh, and I'm going to push this into the bracket and I'm twisting, I'm pushing and twisting and I want those grooves, those threads inside the hole to grab a hold of this. Okay. Now we're going to try this one and see how this works. And I will, most of, most of getting this inside is the twisting. I can take uh, this little pointer here and try to push it in, but that's, I don't know that that's doing much of anything. Now, we have our length again. <clears throat> so, um, I am going to, I'm going to reinstall this and let's see how she looks. Remember, we're going to, of course, let the felt bite onto the, to the race there and wiggle around till the pin drops in. There she goes. Now I want to take my felt, pull her around. Now this felt is plenty long. I might get some wiggling here, but my, I feel better because my, my felt is longer now. Uh -huh. If you look closely at the felt, it's not moving to the degree it was before. Getting a little movement here. Let's see how she's looking. Okay. Now that the bracket is in place, I can push in with my little sharp tool here. Now this particular felt, when I cut it, the top, the top um, part of that little Y shape is actually a little thinner than the other, so it may be lighter in weight. Now I'm going to put sewing machine oil on this and I'm feeding the wick, okay? And that's nice because that wick, and I'm also gonna feed it, by the way, underneath. What about that bottom piece? How are you gonna do that? How are you gonna get oil in that?
there's actually not a space to get at it from there. But underneath, you keep putting oil here. And, and that, that wool, which is what this is made from, is going to wick into the rest of it. And it'll, it'll actually wick itself full of oil. I know that sounds silly, but it's true. Okay, so let's see about getting our wick straightened out here. Part of it, part of the reason it wants to move to the left here is because I've got it highly twisted in there. Now, let's see. Okay, guys, the wick is pretty stable. And I'm going to test this to see how well it stays put. If I don't like it, I can take it out again. And I'll show you another technique. Remember that this was cut with one end being a lot thicker than the other. So I'm going to take it, I'm going to, <clears throat> I'm going to twist it up, and I've just turned it upside down. Now, while it's out, let me go ahead and get the top portion oiled. It would take a while for the oil to flow up, so we'll go ahead and speed that process up. And wool is very absorbent, so it'll hold a good bit of oil. Uh, I don't know if Singer used wool. This, this type of wick goes way back. I have no idea what they originally used. Um, polyester really didn't exist in the 30s, so who the heck knows? Uh, they may have used wool. You know, wool felt is not that expensive. Okay, now, I have taken the wick. <clears throat> I have turned the thicker side up to the top. And I'm going to trim, remember I told you I want the bottom to not be as long as the top section. So I'm going to trim that a little bit. I've never trimmed oily felt before. Cuts just fine. Probably good for this. Probably good for the scissors. Okay, from the top, let's try it again. Let's make sure the wick is biting onto the race. Because you don't want both sides of the wick on the top. Okay. And there we go. Now, <clears throat> take my tool, make sure that my felt is not coming up, that it's sitting where I want it. Now, let's take a look. Okay, success. This is what we wanted. Let's zoom in here, guys. I want you to be able to see that wick. Notice I have oiled the wick. I have gotten the heavier part of the felt on top Whereas the other part was a little, this was the, this, this, gosh, this is the wick I originally had. And the two sides of the wick were pretty even. That other one I had, the wick was a little uh, thinner on the, on the, uh, on one side. That's fine for the bottom. That's not really an issue. <clears throat> but for the top wick, I wanted the thicker piece of it there. And look, it's oiling the top of the race. Aha. So if first you don't succeed, keep trying. Don't give up. And I am proof of that. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put in my bobbin case. Now, strategically, what you can do is you can take your bobbin case and put... Where am I on my camera here? Okay, you can take your bobbin case and you can put uh, one drop of oil right there. This is the part that's going to be sitting on the race. Now, I know I told you guys don't use a lot of oil and you won't. But this oil, I'm not so much worried about it grabbing hold of the lint. It's down in the bottom where you typically get the most of that. Okay, you will notice that the bobbin case has a little, has a little hook, or not a hook, a little space there. And it sits on this part of the bracket. Okay, and that kind of holds it in place. It's not being held down so much as being held, it's being held still in a place where it won't pop out. Now, what do we have to do? We have to get our feed dogs back in place. While you have your feed dog out, you might as well take a look at it. Sometimes when they're really old, feed dogs will, uh, sometimes they get old oil and gummed up uh, lint. Uh, you'd be surprised. You look at the feed dog when it's in the machine. You think, oh, I don't see anything. But I'm going to take my tool here, see if I can find any, any stuff that's hiding. There's a little bit came off on my 
finger, if you can see that, not a lot, but it's a lot easier to, to, to see and to kind of poke around when you have it out of the machine. You can do it when it's in the machine, I have, but okay. So I'm taking, what I'm seeing here is mostly old greasy uh, lint. You can even go into the, uh, the grooves of the feed dog if you really want to get retentive about things. Uh, anyone who restores sewing machines must have some love of detail or they wouldn't spend hours doing this. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, Alrighty, uh, not seeing anything else major here. Just for good measure, I'll take my, where are you, brush? I'll take my brush, and again, I'll go over it, just kinda, again, I like this brush because it has real stiff bristles, and just make sure, uh, I think it should be good to go. Now, I put the screw that goes, that holds the feed dog in place, I put it back in the feed dog just so I wouldn't lose it or mix it up. Now, let's zoom back in. I'm gonna show you, you may or may not remember from the first video, there is a spot, and it is to the right of your shovel area, right here. And you might see it moving right there, okay? There's a little slot, and your feed dog faces you like this, okay? Not like that, because it won't work, you'll be, you'll, it, it won't have clearance, okay? It goes in one way, guys, and it's this way, okay? And the, the slot with the screw hole is gonna be on your right, and then the feed dog will look like this. So we're gonna put it, we're gonna find the slot, we'll put it down in there. Uh, it's clean. Again, this, there's room here. This is not a very tight area, so I'm not worried about, it's still got a film of uh, old oil on it, but it's not, it's not gummy, it's not gonna cause any problems, so I'm not really worried about that. Now, let's go underneath, and you will recall that I uh, was working really hard to get light under here. Showing the bottom of a sewing machine is not the easiest thing to do, but I think we've got good light today. If you hold on for me there, I promise we're not on a boat. Let's see. Okay, let's take a look. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> you always wanna be real specific. When you're underneath a machine, if there are lots of bolts here that do not come out, they are not meant to come out, leave them alone. But back here, you will see a rivet right there, okay? And you will see this little arm here, and you know that that, that the feed dogs are going to go up here because you can see it's, you can see daylight if you're looking up through the top. Right here is a hole for this screw. Okay, it's not the rivet; it's right there. Okay, so if you find sort of the middle of that arch up there, come straight down, and you'll find where the feed dog inserts. Now, I don't know if you guys can see this, but right now the feed dog. Uh, is protruding, I can push it up. See how it's protruding down? That's because it's waiting to be held in place by this bolt. Now, <clears throat> something to point out. Whenever you are putting a bolt or a screw back in, in, in a sewing machine, you don't have to do this, but I think it's good policy. I take, um, let me see if I can get here. I'm trying not to to, to, to do too much zooming in and out for you guys so you don't get seasick. Okay, I'm gonna take one drop of sewing oil. I'm gonna put it at the very bottom of the threads of this screw. That's it. Why did I do that? Because someday in the future, if this has to be taken apart, it's gonna be a lot easier. Uh, I didn't have problems with this, but why not? You know, it takes very little time and it, it, it will help you or someone else in the future. Uh, and it's not going to make the screw come loose. So there, you go, ex except for when you want it to. Now I've got the in my in my left hand up here. You guys can see I've got a hold of the feed dog, but I want you to see underneath. Now notice, notice. Keep looking in this area. Do you see that protrusion? Watch. I'm going to push down on the feed dog. You see the uh, the bottom of it coming out. Now I'm pulling up. I'm going to put my screw in, and that hole in the side of the feed dog flange I'm waiting to find, and you kind of have to slide in until you feel the screw move <clears throat> to, the, to the left, and when you do, 
you'll know that it's lined up in that feed dog hole. Uh, and now, I, what do I want? I want my screwdriver tip. Okay. Actually, I don't even want the screwdriver arm at the moment. I just want the tip in my hand. That's all I need for now. Okay. So we've got this bolt and I've got a hold of the, the feed dog. Okay. Now I'm going to pull up. Now, there's something interesting about the way this works. The hole for this screw has travel. It has the ability to move. Watch, I've got the screw in the feed dog and it's going through the hole of the feed dog. If I tighten the screw, the feed dog won't move. If I loosen the screw, it is still anchored into the feed dog, uh, uh, the, lower, uh, the lower piece of the feed dog there. But notice it moves up and down, guys. This is a, <laughs> this is literally analog. <clears throat> Uh, the method for adjusting your feed dogs. And you think, oh man, I gotta adjust my feed dogs? Yes, you do. But it's not tough. It's pretty easy. And I'm gonna show you how. Let's come back to this side. And I want my needle plate. So you might be thinking, why in the heck are you gonna put your needle plate in? It would be helpful if I zoomed back out so you can see. All right. So I've got my feed dog, the screw is in, but it's not tightened yet, but the screw is down below. So the feed dogs are, are they're kind of in, but not completely. Now, where did those screws go? These are the screws that hold the needle plate in place, right? I took these out at the beginning in the last video. I'm gonna do the same thing with these screws that I mentioned to you uh, that I did with that feed dog screw. I'm going to take one drop of sewing machine oil, just one, put it on the very base of the threads of this screw. Okay, that's all I want. And again, it's, it's just you're future proofing this thing so that for you or someone else, it's not a pain. There's no dirt here on this. I was just checking. Okay, now I'm going to get the needle plate back on. And I'll show you why in a minute. We need this needle plate on because that's going to help us understand where our feed dogs need to be. If you don't adjust your feed dogs, they could be too high, uh, which can cause problems, or they could be too low, which means you're not going to get much feeding. You might think, well, why did they make them adjustable? They did that because this machine did not come with a uh, device to help you lower or raise feed dogs. And there were times when people wanted to do darning and they would want to lower those feed dogs. And <clears throat> there are ways to lower the feed dogs to get them out of the way. It's kind of a hassle, but back in those days, they didn't think it was a hassle. I mean, you don't know what you don't have if, uh, if the technology hasn't been invented. Okay, so the needle plate is in place. Why did I go on and on about that? Now, I'm gonna reach my hand under here and watch, watch this, guys. Look at the, let's zoom in. Where's my zoomer? Okay, watch the feed dogs. I have got my hand, my finger is underneath the machine and I'm pushing up on the feed dog. You guys see that? Okay, that's the feed dogs are loose, but that's because they're adjustable. Okay, <clears throat> real sophisticated measuring device here. I have a dime, a US 10 cent coin with FDR's head on it. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sit it here, and I knew it would do that. I'm going to put it here, and this has gotta be one of the strangest things I've ever tried to video. Uh, okay, I know exactly what we're gonna do. To make now, I always tell people never put tape on a sewing machine because I have spent hours taking off paint, uh, excuse me, tape residue off a machine, but we're not gonna have a problem here because I've got scotch tape, but it's only gonna be in there for a few minutes and we're gonna pull it right off and it'll be fine. Just don't put tape on your machine and leave it. You will make someone really unhappy and it might be you. Okay, so I've got a dime here. Why do I need the dime? Because that is the height I want my feed dogs. Now, 
I'm gonna move the camera. Okay, everyone, I have moved the camera. And what you are looking at is a very, this is kind of like the insect's view of this thing. It's hard to get light on there, but the dime is sitting there. And what you're gonna do is you're going to adjust the feed dog from underneath in such a way that you are going to have your, fing your other finger here across the dime, like that. And then when you feel the feed dog touch your finger, you know you've got it about the right height for, for most fabrics, for most sewing. Now, if you want to be a little more uh, accurate, you can take something flat. Let's take, for example, here's the, the bobbin cover that we don't need at the moment, okay? It's, it's laying across the dime, now watch. I don't know if you heard that, but I, I, I can feel the uh, feed dog, watch. I don't know if you heard that click, but that's the feed dog hitting the surface of the bobbin plate. What does that tell me? It tells me that's exactly where I want my feed dogs to be adjusted to. So while doing this, okay, I am going to show you underneath how we're gonna do this. It's not hard, guys. It's kind of comical because you really need another set of hands here. I do it myself, but doing this and trying to videotape it and, and encourage you to try is, uh, uh, you just have to laugh at something. So bear with me here. Okay, guys, uh, above the machine, like above, I have my left hand holding that bobbin plate on top of the dime, and it is, it is uh, cantilevered across over where my feed dogs are. Now, I've got this little screwdriver here for pointing purposes. Look where the tip of the screwdriver is. Now watch. Do you see this little flange of metal? It's attached to the screw, now watch. It and the screw just moved. I can pull them back down, okay? So notice, it's moving. I can move it with my finger, okay? So the, so the, so the set screw is through the hole of the flange of the feed dogs, but they're moving because they haven't been tightened. When I push up, tightened it a little too much there, okay. Do you hear the clicking? That tapping is the top of the feed dog bumping into the bobbin plate that I'm using as its ceiling so it won't go any further. So I'm gonna take the tip of my screwdriver and I'm gonna push to make sure it stays. Now I'm pushing uh, that flange on the feed dog, I'm pushing up and the feed dog is now in contact with that bobbin plate. Now I'm gonna take my thumb and I'm gonna Put, keep pushing because if you drop it, if you take your pressure off, it's going to fall back down. Um, and I've done this enough times to remember. Now, while I've got the plate in place over the feed dogs, I am pushing up with this little screwdriver in my hand. Now, I've got that, and now I need my other screwdriver to tighten the bolt. I'm just doing it by hand now, but I gotta get it there where it won't move. Now, I'm gonna let go of this. All right, I've got my ratchet, and I am going to now <clears throat> tighten this bolt. We're not torquing it like it's going into outer space. We're just gonna make it snug. Snug is good. Now watch, I've still got the plate. It should be enough. Uh, it should have been tightened enough with that bolt that it's not gonna slip. It's snug. Now, I may snug it just a little extra, because remember, the feed dogs, they have a lot of movement. Now. Let's see how I did. And if I can zoom back out, you can see how I did. Now, the dime is still there. The feed dogs are up. <clears throat> and my plate and my feed dogs. <clears throat> 
Let's see if I can get this in a better place where you can see it. Now, notice that the feed dog height and the dime are the same. That's where I want, all you saw was the top of my hand. Hold on a minute. Okay, you see the dime, you see the feed dogs. When I put the plate here, the plate is flat. It stays flat, guys. They are now aligned with <coughs> Franklin Roosevelt. <laughs> so let's take, while it's fresh, let's take that tape off. We have now installed the feed dogs 